not only did we sing a song about inviting the presence of Christ to come in, but the word of God promises that where two are gathered in his name, there he is right in the midst of us. Um, I know as we've been in this journey for a little bit, um, you see the, the theme of this year for IBC is the year of what? Kingdom come. And part of that kingdom comes, um, not only the challenge and the call of God, but also maybe even the personal impact on each of us. When we ask the kingdom of God to come in us, which means there is an invitation for the rule and the realm and the control of God to actually take over our realm. And so a lot of this actually, um, as a church, we're, we're seeing what God is doing. And I don't think it's an accident that we're experiencing what we're experiencing on this year of kingdom come, that we're needing the rule of God even outside of the body of Christ here at IBC, but not only in Singapore, but globally as well. Um, but this past week, um, really, it's been kind of a, as many of you know, we have a pretty much of a sequence of messages and it's mapped out and the staff knows that even up until December, it's all mapped out like every sermon. And so, but this day is a little different because God kind of shifted um, my direction. So for the new, next two weeks, it's still in the theme of kingdom come because the king has actually pushed me in this direction. I did argue with him quite a bit. I said, Lord, there's already a message prepared in Matthew chapter 5, and so this is also perfect. But he said, you know what? Today, they need to hear Ephesians chapter 1. And Ephesians chapter 1 will speak of the sovereignty of God. And so we're going to take a shift today, and we're going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians 1. And the message for the next two weeks, this two-week series coming out of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Today will be chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. And the Word of God says this, I, Paul, he says, as the, I, Paul, let me get this going here, one second, ah, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the God and the, of the Lord, blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then it says, back up a little bit. Hang on, it's going to get to me. Let's go back to verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then it says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Verse 5, And love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. I think as we are going to be challenging you over the next two weeks, this simple message that God speaks hope into our crisis. And I know that this year of kingdom come and the salt and light last week was exactly what God needed us to hear. The, 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 the peacemakers the week before. But today we're just going to take a shift because I want you to know that no matter what crisis we may be in, that God will speak hope. Whether it's on a personal level, whether it's on a national level, or whether it's on a global level. So on a personal level, I'm, I'm immediately brought back to the story of Abraham. When Abraham was given a promise at the age of 75 that he'll be a great nation, but he had no children. His wife was 65. How many of you ladies are over 65 and do not, are not afraid to admit that? <laughs> Just raise your hand if you're over 65. And, and if you have no child at the age of 65 and someone says, you're going to be a great nation and you're going to have a child and you're 65, how many of you would be a little excited right now? That, that would be a little bit of a shocking news, right? But the promise is actually not fulfilled until Sarah reaches 90 years old. So he's in a personal crisis. And yet God gives him and Sarah a child. Amazing how God speaks. And then a few years later, if you remember, God tells him to go sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah, and he's doing that. He's at another crisis, is he not? And he's about to slay him, and God provides. But not only does he provide, he reveals and speaks into Abraham with the name Yahweh Jireh. God provides. So it seems like God's specialty is crisis. Would you agree? 
He specializes in crises. This is where he shines the best. This is where he shows up the most. On a national crisis, um, Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. Exodus 2 records that the people groaned, that they cried out for help and for hope and guide, and, and they were in slavery and oppression for those 400 years plus, and God heard their prayer. And God sent a deliverer by the name of Moses to deliver, which we would call the Exodus. And so God spoke in their time of crisis. Globally, in the first century, the world was in a crisis. They desperately needed savior. They desperately needed hope and salvation. And so Galatians 4, 4 says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son born of a virgin. And so he sends not only a word, spoken word, he sent the living word. So whether we are in a personal crisis today, God speaks hope to you. Whether we're in a national crisis today in Singapore, God speaks hope into you today. And whether we're in a global crisis, which we are in some, to some extent, God speaks hope. So we see that, do we not? We see what's going on not only in Singapore, we're seeing what's going on in the Middle East, but now we're seeing what's going on in, in Wuhan and Hubei and China and now Korea. We, we see the exponential increase in certain areas, and you're going, you know, where we need, to, we need God here. In Singapore, it, we see Singapore Air and Silk Air cancel 700 flights for the next three months. We see Sentosa's um, hotels are less than 30%. Singapore as a whole, less than 50%. The food and beverage business, they estimate that there will be 80% loss. So you see that. You see churches, as we mentioned last week with Grace Assembly. We see other churches suspend services, the Catholic masses, not only here, but also in Hong Kong. You see see, uh, churches like City Harvest, and you see um, Faith Community and other churches, and Adams Presbyterian. And so you're thinking, suspension of services. And right here in IBC, we've suspended everything that meets at the church. And so we're, we're looking at this thing, and we're going, there's, a, there's an element of crisis here. We are in a place many of us have never been. And I'm telling you today, God has a word for us. He speaks hope into us. And so this Ephesians 1 passage, if you, if you look at that passage, we're going to be looking at just verses 1 through 6. But I want to deposit for the next two weeks a word of God that in the middle of our crisis, God's word will not only give us hope, but it will actually allow us to transcend our crisis and allow us to see from his perspective. So we open up Ephesians chapter one, and it says that God will speak hope into a church in need. So Paul opens up and he says, I, Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, Then he mentions the target audience, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And then he gives a greeting, says, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to open up with just Paul speaking to us. Now, as he speaks that hope into us and he speaks to our need, he's speaking to a church that's in need as well. The church at Ephesus is obviously um, in the Roman Empire, and at that particular time, Nero is the emperor, and so persecution is beginning to spread. Paul, if you know this, he's writing from a city called Rome, but he's in a certain location. Anybody remember the location? What type of housing is he in right now? I don't think he's in HDB, and I don't think he's at the Hyatt. Where, where do you think Paul is when he's writing this? In jail. How many of you would say that would classify as a crisis? That would definitely, right? And so he's writing from jail in his own personal crisis to a church that is going through all kinds of struggles and an empire that's beginning to oppress Christianity. So it would hit personal, it would hit local, and it would hit global as well. And so he identifies himself as Paul, and then he calls himself an apostle. So this is the messenger of the messenger of hope, the the messenger that God is going to use. And he identifies himself as the one who's been sent by God. That's the word apostle that someone has been sent. But it also assumes that before God sends somebody, he seizes them and captures their own heart. And Paul would say that, mercy found me. And so because mercy has captivated him, he is no longer his own. Now, when you belong to Jesus Christ, you can be sent anywhere. Would you agree with that? He sent me here to Singapore. My life is no longer my own. 
God has sent you here by divine design and by divine decree and by divine purpose. And so when he says, I'm an apostle sent, you too have been sent. You, you belong to Jesus, but you're no longer your own. And now he's commissioned by Christ on mission with a message from the master. And now as he talks, he says, I'm an apostle, yes, but I'm here by the will of God. This is not my human idea, that I'm not in jail because of my choice. I'm here by the will of God. I'm writing to a church that needs hope. Why? Because of the will of God. And I would extend it to you today as well, that God speaks hope to you and you're in a place. Why? Because of the will of God. That this is by divine design. This is where he's going to speak into us. So who's the target audience? So that's the author. The target audience is Ephesus. And so it says in Ephesus, some of you have a, 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 a text that says um, that this word in Ephesus may not be in some of the earliest manuscripts, but it's obviously targeted at churches that Paul's very familiar with. And perhaps it's targeted first at Ephesus and then it goes across Asia Minor. It's a circular letter. But Paul had established a church in Ephesus in his third missionary journey. He spent three years there, so he knows this church almost better than any other church. But then he identifies the church with these two phrases. He says, to the saints who are in Ephesus. And I want you to know that what he's about to say is not for outsiders. What you're hearing today, the outsiders will not understand. What God's word of his hope from his word and from the spirit of God will not be able to be comprehended or grasped, nor is it targeted to pre-believers. This is what we would call inside information. So he's targeting saints, and the word saints never appears in the New Testament except in plural form, which means he's always, when you're thinking about saints, it's never in isolation, it's in community. It's always within a network, a family of believers, of, of those who have come together. And so he's targeting saints, and this is the believers, this is the community of faith. The word saint means, to, it comes from the root word holy, which means you've been set apart, that we should be different than the world that the way we're responding to this crisis should be radically different than the way the world responds, that we should walk in confidence, that we should walk in faith, that we should walk in hope. So we're called to be separated from this world, not only from their fear, not only from their sense of, uh, of doom and desperation, but also from sin as well. And we've been set apart to God. And then the second phrase that he uses to identify the target audience is the word faithful those who have a living and a love relationship with God. Remember last week we introduced two different cr groups of people in Jesus' audience on Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it mentions the crowds. Remember that? Any of you remember the second um, designation? Not only were crowds there, but there was a second designation. Disciples. So these are the ones who are faithful. These are the ones who are committed. So if you're here and you're an audience or you're a crowd, uh, th this message will not ring so true and so loud and so comforting. But if you're a believer, if you're faithful, if you've been a saint, if you've been called by the name of Jesus Christ and you have identified him as your Lord, then this word will offer a word of comfort. Then he sends a Christian greeting. So there's a messenger, Paul. There's an audience, Ephesus, and the church, they're faithful and saints. But then there's a greeting, and we call it a Christian greeting. So he says, grace to you and peace. Now, I think in the first, in, in, in 21st century, we kind of take those together, and they are. But in the first century, they would actually sometimes make a distinction. The first word is actually targeted at Gentiles. It comes from a Greek greeting, rejoice, so it's a very close um, 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 expression of that. And so he's calling, he says, I, I want you to know grace, which is God's unmerited favor. But this is to the Gentiles primarily. And then he says, peace, which is really targeted at the Jews. Remember the peace, the, the greeting in peace in Hebrew? What, what is it? Anybody remember? Shalom. And so what that greeting says is this message is for everyone, regardless of your ethnicity, whether you're Greek or Gentile or Jew. And then notice the order. Grace first. So we get that unmerited favor. Then and only then will we experience peace and that restoration of a relationship with God and potentially with each other as well. Then where we're, the meat of the message is actually found in verses 3 through 6 today. But 3 through 14 in chapter 1 is actually one sentence. I want you to hear that again. One sentence, 11 verses. 
This is the longest sentence in all of Scripture. It goes on and on. If you read it all at once, it gets a little confusing. So my prayer is that God's Spirit will actually um, make it at least, not simple, but in a way that we can understand it. So we're going to target just as verses 3 through 16, but I mean 3 through 6. But if you read it together, it would almost be like Paul is just randomly pulling things. And one writer says it really well. He says, it's like Paul is seeing gift after gift, wonder after wonder that is passing before his eyes, and it provokes him to praise. And this is really a praise to God. And I think our worship team has set us up, up well, has prepared our hearts for this message as we exalt God even in our wilderness, even in our crises, even when the, the unknown. We have no idea what next week is going to hold. None of us could have predicted four weeks ago that we would be sitting here today. So many things are out of our hands. Would you agree with that? So many things are, 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 are we're, we're not totally powerless and helpless, but we are by large powerless and helpless to many of the things that have transpired. No one could have predicted what have taken place in Korea a week ago. And so we stand here today and Paul is telling us to look up, to praise him, to exalt him. And so this is, to me, verses 3 through 14, it's Paul's, um, it's almost like an a, a, a invocation um, to praise, uh, a, an expression of praise, but also an invitation for us to join him. And so we're going to pick up God's word in verse 3. And again, as we walk out of here today, and no matter what environment you're going to, whether you're staying in your home whether you, you, you're limiting your activities, whether you're not traveling or whether you are traveling, and what kind of people that you interact with, I'm going to challenge you to take this word. So there's going to be these three simple messages that God wants you to know, regardless of what has happened around you. Number one, God has blessed us. Number two, God has chosen us. And number three, God has predestined us. Now, that's regardless of what you see around you. No matter how you feel today, no matter what you've heard today in the news, no matter what is the latest report, no matter what your company is doing, your school is doing, or even the changes among the church activities, I want you to know that, number one, God has blessed you, God has chosen you, and God has predestined you. So let's pick up the first one. First one is this. It says, it starts in verse 3. Paul says, bless it is the God of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, how many of you have ever seen people tell you to bless God, and, and you're in hardship, in trial, in adversity, and the person you're t who's telling you to bless God looks like everything is going really well for them? I, I love these pastors who stand a lot of times, and they stand, and, and they tell you to bless God, and they look like they're flourishing. And, and you are in, in the middle of your pit. But I want you to know when Paul tells us in verse 3, blessed be the God, he's invoking us to bless the blesser. That he is not speaking out of somebody who is immune to hardship and trial. In fact, I want you to take your Bibles in just a few books before in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you go to Ephesians and Galatians is right before and then 2 Corinthians is right before before that. In verse 11, I want you to hear what Paul has experienced. He's telling us, and by the way, 2 Corinthians was written before Ephesians. And so he's telling us, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he's telling us to bless the blesser, I want you to know what kind of hardship, what kind of pattern of life he's experienced for him to even say this. Look in verse, um, chapter 11, verse 23. It says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I'm more so. Now he lists all the things that he's experienced. Ready for this? In, my, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. How many of you, that sounds just like the prosperity gospel. <laughs> Nothing like it, right? Look what it says in verse 24. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, 
We can even just add dangers from airports, right? We can just keep adding. It says danger from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in the sea, danger among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and in thirst, without food and cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. How many of you would say he's been through a little hardship? In fact, I would dare say more than any of us by far. And yet, what does he tell us to do? Blessed be the God of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling us to bless the blesser. And so the word blessing shows up three times in verse three, all right? Three times. And the word bless, we get our word eulogy. In fact, if you look at the original text, It's actually transliterated from our word eulogy. And eulogy is divided into two words, E-U and the word L-O-G-Y. L-O-G-Y means to speak. E-U speaks of well. So when you give a eulogy, you speak well. So we are to speak well of God. How do we do that? Well, we just did it just a moment ago. We spoke well of God as we praised him, as we glorified him, as we thank him. We can bless God. Even in our crisis, I know some of you have been staying up with the different case numbers here in Singapore, but case number 48 got my attention. Many of you read this. It's in the Salt and Light publication. So this is a Singaporean from Grace Assembly. Doesn't give name, but he gives a testimony of what's taken place. So as they were given tests and they were all tested, his came back positive. So he had one hour to get his stuff ready at home. He was picked up by an ambulance, taken to the National Center of Infectious Diseases, and he was immediately quarantined and isolated. Not only was he isolated, he was put into a room that had double glass, and the only way that you could be fed was through a hatch door. All the medical personnel that came in contact with him was fully um, in medical gear. And these are his words. He says, I felt like a leper. I felt like a prisoner, and his his spirits began to plunge. He didn't know what was happening. He was taken away from family. He's isolated. They didn't do anything for a day, and it just began to just crumble on him. Then they gave him another test, but this test came back negative. So all of a sudden, his heart began to jump, and he began to praise God, and, and, and he began to rejoice But they kept him then because the initial test was positive. And so they kept him. But the next day, they did the test again. And then it was the other end of the pendulum as he plummeted down to the pit. And he was tested at positive. He said he was absolutely and utterly crushed. He lost hope. Again, isolated. Not only that, his name was beginning to leak out into the social media. And as his name was getting leaked out in social media, he began to receive all kinds of harsh criticism all through, just slamming him, criticizing. And what hurt him the most was some of those people who were criticizing him and saying all kinds of harsh comments against him were people that he knew. He felt abandoned. He felt crushed. He felt guilty. Did he infect other people? So all of this was swirling in his mind and he was just plummeting. But then something changed his mind. Because God sent a word of hope. How did it change? His wife sent him a text. And the text said these words. Not going to let this rob my praise. Jesus is good. And his mercies, his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Let's raise a hallelujah. hallelujah. He put his phone down. And he began to worship God. Everything changed where? In his heart. As God brought him through that journey, this is what he wrote as he concluded the statement. He says, through this, I've learned the depth of my failings and my blindness. And yet this, through this, I saw the goodness of God and all the blessings he's given me. Let me ask you this. We're in the middle of what we're in the middle of. And let me ask you, are you blessing God, are you blaming God? Are you praising him? Are you panicking? Have you directed your heart toward thanksgiving? Or have you slumped and just, just, 
kind of slipped into the abyss. God is calling us, bless the Lord. Bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the writer gives you a reason. Why should we bless the blesser? Why should we speak well? Why should we sing praises? Why should we give glory? Why should we thank him? Why? It tells us in verse 3, because it says, for he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. How many of you would say the way we bless God is different than the way he blesses us? That was a question. How many of you say that? Or does he just say, oh, I, I think, you know, I think Rodney, that's good, it's good. Uh, does, he, does he bless us like we bless him? Absolutely not. When he blesses us, it's radically different. When we bless him, we thank him, we give him praise, we glorify. But when he blesses us, the floodgates of heaven are opened up. We see his choice, we see his predestination, we see his redemption, we see his inheritance, we see the gift of the Holy Spirit. All of this is found in Ephesians chapter 1. The blessings come from God, and they come in abundance, because it says every spiritual blessing. That word every can also be translated whole, not partial. So when God gives blessings, he doesn't give it to you in just little small droplets. He doesn't give it to you in portions. He says Every spiritual blessing has been poured out to you. Nothing has been withheld. And yet some of you say, why am I sick? Why is my friend sick? Why are we in this fear? Why is all of this going on? Because look at the word, every spiritual blessing, which isn't material, which isn't earthly. Sometimes it comes in forms of that, but God highlights the spiritual aspect of the blessing. The spiritual aspect means it comes from the Holy Spirit. It says, then these spiritual blessings are found in the heavenlies. What in the world does that mean? The word heavenlies are found nowhere. That word is found nowhere in Scripture other than Ephesians. So what does the word heavenlies mean? It means this is a place where God blesses. This is the storehouse of blessing. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, it's a place where we'll unite with Christ again. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, it's the place where we speak and preach the gospel to the principalities. Ephesians 6, 12, it's the place where we do spiritual warfare. So when we are blessed, we are blessed in abundance, in totality, in wholeness, in fullness. Where? With God's spiritual blessings. And where do those spiritual blessings come from? They come from heaven itself. And so we're going to open up today, and we're going to turn to Psalm 103, one of my favorite blessing passages, um, verses 1 through 5. So I'm going to ask each of all of us to stand, and we're going to do what the Scripture tells us to do. We're going to bless the blesser. Why? Because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Let's read this together. And my prayer is, no matter where you are, what condition you're in, what you've seen, let us today look up and see our blesser and let us give him proper due. So let's read this together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Let's say bless the Lord together. Bless the Lord. You may be seated. How many of you already feel better? I mean, how many times do we blame instead of bless? How many times our vision gets blurry and God calls us to bless? I love what Job says, right? Bless the Lord. He says, the Lord giveth and taketh away. I will still bless the Lord. It's easy to bless in the land of plenty. Not so easy to bless in the land of the wilderness. It's easy to bless when things are going well. It's much more difficult to bless. But you see, God is sovereign. How do we know this? Because we come to the second truth. So today we walk out knowing this. God, God has blessed us. Now we come to the second one. Look in verse 4. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless. So this word choose means to select. And sometimes it gives, in the context, 
of being chosen or being selected from a group of many, God has chosen you. God has selected you. God knows your name. He's directed his love and his compassion to each and every person here today. God has chosen you. This isn't just a group choice. This is an individual choice. This choice is personal. It is close to your heart that God has chosen you and has picked you out of above all others. He has chosen you. But look what it says. This, this, law, this choice is found in Christ, just as he chose us in him, which means without what Christ has done in his work, there would be no election of you. What Christ has done has provided the possibility that he would choose us. If Christ did not come, if he did not die, if he did not sacrifice himself, if he did not express his love like this, I would not have been chosen. I would not have been elected. I would not have been selected. But because I am in Christ, Christ has now laid the groundwork for his choice, his selection, not only of me, but of you. Now we come to the best part. When did he choose us? Like in verse 4, just as he chose us, and then it's the timing of the choosing, which is quite, to me, profound. He chose us where or when? Before or when? How long ago was that? Before you were born? Before the virus? God chose you. This is not based on what we see and what we feel now. God chose us before the foundation of the world. Now, that word foundation of the world comes from an architectural term of throwing down or laying down the foundation before a structure is built. And so he's saying, before the foundation of the world was, was put in place, I chose you. To me, that changes everything, doesn't it? Because we're up and down with the latest bit of news. Now we know that if you're from Singapore, you're probably not going to be able to enter Israel. And who knows what other countries are going to be closed to us. Things change, right? So what, what your travel schedule, your, 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 your business, whatever it might be, those change daily or weekly or monthly. And yet God says before creation, before the foundation, I chose you. I selected you. I came across a good friend of mine as a pastor in Houston. And last week he shared this with his congregation, quite remarkable about the timing of God's choosing. In 2018, there was a young lady that accompanied her father from China to Houston. The father was receiving medical treatment at a famous cancer hospital in the U.S. called MD Anderson. And it was going to take several months. And so she got there in 2018 with her father. But while she was there, she hooked up and connected with the Baptist church there in Houston. There's like a lot of them, all right? <laughs> so there's like 635 Southern Baptist churches in Houston. So this is one of many. And so she hooked up with one, but she came to faith in Christ there. Then God led her and the church encouraged her to share her faith. In 2019, she had to go back to her home because her father finished the long treatment. And so they went back. Anybody want to guess where her hometown was? Wuhan. Can you believe that? And so when she gets there, and all the things begin to emerge, because she's been sharing her faith, and she's talking about it. But this is what she says. This is her testimony that she wrote the pastor. She says, you know what? Everything is still now. <laughs> all we have time is talk. No one goes out. So for the very first time, we're able to talk. And I want you to hear this, IBC, and I want you to hear this for those who live in Singapore. For the very first time, we have a chance to talk about issues that are important of life and death. Then she writes these words, which is quite shocking, by the way, because as a result of this experience and the, the virus in Wuhan, three of her family members accept Christ. Multiple friends are now on the, on the, on, on, on the, on the chat groups and they, they're, they're hearing testimonies and they're hearing scripture for the very first time. And many of the responses are this, I want to believe in God. I want to know more. So she responds with this, quite a different perspective. 
The suffering is a disguised blessing. Compared to the confirmed or even death cases, I'm more excited about the thriving of the gospel. People are finally forced to sit still. People are finally forced to admit the weaknesses of humanity. This is a chance for all of us to reflect on our pride and our worthless lifestyle. Then she makes this final closing statement. I believe this plague, interesting phrase, is a disguised blessing from God our Father. Wow, I don't know how many of us would be able to say that. A disguised blessing from our Father in heaven. I want to encourage you again. God's timing is always perfect, right? He chose this young lady when? Before the foundation of the earth. When did he choose her? Before she was born. When did he choose her? Before she made the trip to the U.S. with her dad to receive what? Cancer treatment. Before when? Before that virus broke out in Wuhan. God chose her. I want to encourage you today that God has chosen you before the foundation of the earth. He's put you and placed you strategically and spiritually right where you need to be in order for you to convey hope and light. See, I think sometimes we turn the question, and I've heard this over the last month, why here? Why, why, why are we affected? What's going on? Why now? I just moved to Singapore. <laughs> we thought Singapore was safe. And why me? Wrong questions. Question is, God chose you. And why God chose you before the foundation of the earth. And what's the purpose of choice? Not for you just to be set aside and to be in a special group. But he says he chose us so that we may be holy and blameless. God's choice of you is not for you to bask in your, um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm elected. I'm selected by God. I, I have a different status. I, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged. And yes, we are in so many ways. But God's purpose for you being chosen is that you would be holy and blameless. That word holy means that you'll be set apart, that you'll be different, that you would be like the yellow angels that we talked about last week in Wuhan, that you would stand distinct from the world that you're in, that you would actually be salt, that you'd be light, not to immerse yourself in the same fear and be overwhelmed with the same paralysis of, of panic than the world is going, but to stand with confidence to say, before the foundations of the world, God chose. And he chose us to be holy. The second word is blameless. That word blameless means that, that we have no blame. And that blame has been removed. It's been extracted. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. So now he says we are for the very first time. Because we are elected, because we are selected, because we are chosen, we are now fit to serve him. God did not elect me and he did not elect you in order for you to continue in sin. That's not the purpose. The purpose of our election is to be holy, to be blameless, to be fit for service, to stand remarkably distinct and different than the world, to be the yellow angels, to be salt, to be light, to be blessers instead of blamers, to be centered in Christ instead of Christ says. God has called us to be unique. In fact, I would dare say holiness and blamelessness is almost a test of whether or not you're even elect at all. If God has chosen you, this guy, he did not choose you to do whatever you want to do. He chose you to be holy and blameless before him, that audience of one. Then we come to the final truth that we're talking about this morning. It's found in verse 5. It says, in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of his glory, which he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. And so this last point to me is one of the most difficult ones for many of our 21st century Christians to understand, that God predestined us. What does that word predestined mean? It means that he set you aside. And remember, he just told you he blessed you. He just told you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, he has blessed you. Second, he just told us that he has chosen us in Christ to be holy and blameless. Now he comes with the third truth. 
that he is predestined. So he, that means he, we've been predetermined. We've been set aside. We've been marked out. That, that we, we have been predestined, predetermined, pre-select. And, and now it's a little bit more elaboration than the word election. And a lot of people look at this word and they go, whoa, pastor. It, it sounds a little cold and calculated that God would choose. It sounds like some distant, foreign, remote deity. But this is not our God. It's not a, 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 a celestial roll of the dice. Are you in? Are you out? Odds, numbers are out. Even numbers are in. This country's out. This country's in. This ethnic group's in. This ethnic group's out. This group, we think that God is, but I want you to see how God predestined us. Look at the very first phrase, in love. God is not communicating his predestination apart from his love. And that love is not cold and calculated. That love isn't just putting distance between him and his creation. He's just kind of like picking and choosing. He's choosing us and he's predestined us. He's predetermined us based on his love. Changes everything. In fact, if you go back to, if you know your Old Testament, this is not anything unusual. In the book of Deuteronomy, he chooses Israel. But I want you to pick up in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. It says, the Lord did not choose you because you were more in number than any of the other peoples. But rather, you were fewer of all the peoples. But he chose you, and I want you to hear this, because God loved you. So why are you chosen? God loves you. Why were you predetermined? Why were you predestined? Why were you marked out beforehand? Because of his love for you. So it's not fatalism. It's not predeterminism. It's not this, this sense of distant deity. It is a one-on-one -on -one love relationship with God. That the motive of his, his predetermination, his predestination, is because he loves you. To me, that changes how I look at what's going on. You are loved. I am loved by our Father. And because of his love, he has determined our path. He has set it out before us. And his love has brought you here today as well. The second part of this is, is that he chooses us, or he, he predetermines us in love. But look at the direction. It says, in order that we might be adopted as sons in Jesus Christ. So our predetermination is that we're brought into a family, that we're brought into a body of Christ, that we're adopted together. Now, for the Jews, they didn't understand the word adoption real well because it was not a practice. It wasn't common at all. But Paul had kind of taken that concept out of the Roman practice of adoption, and he, he, he applied it to us. And the adoption in the Roman practice is that a father, a biological father, would give or sell his son, give or sell his son, some transaction, to a, an adopted father. And so they had to do it legally in front of witnesses and a judge. There was no informal behind the, the scenes uh, maneuvering. It had to be public. It had to be official. It had to be legal. It had to be witnesses. And so the biological father would, would give his son and, and would sell his son to the adopted father two times. Because he would buy his son back twice, buy his son back. But the third time, whenever the adopted son, adopted father paid for the son, he would take the son and the, and the deal was final and sealed. That moment, the adopted father covered all the debts of the one that was being adopted. All the rights and all the privileges and all the debts and liabilities of the old family have been set aside. And now the new adopted son now has gained the rights and the privileges of a new family with a new name. So now we as believers, we have been adopted. We've been predetermined. We've been predestined to what? To lose our old family. Which family is that? The world, sin, all of this. And God paid a price. And the price was his son. The purchase price was on the cross. And he bought. And so our debt of sin was paid. The wages of sin is death. The adopted father paid the price, and now our debts are clear. Now we are coming into this new family, and we have new rights and new privileges that we've never had before, and that because of that rights and privileges, we have a new name. And the Word of God says, not only do we have a new name, we have a new home. I tell you, when you're going through this crisis, God wants you to know that you've been predestined, you've been predetermined, you've been set apart in His love 
in order to be adopted into the family, and our home is not here. The third one says, it says, according to his will. In verse 9, if you look at this one, this is um, the kind intention of his will. I love how Paul phrases that. His will is not cold and hard. It's kind intention of his will. Verse 9, it talks about a uh, mystery of his will, and we'll talk about that next week. Verse um, 11 talks about that, that this will is the counsel of his will, which means it's wise. And so we're talking about this will of God. And I can't understand the will. I don't know why we're here completely. God does, though. Why are we going this in Singapore, through this in Singapore and uh, um, in China and Korea and Japan and all the surrounding countries? Why? I don't understand all of this. But I do, and I've seen these testimonies come out, that the will of God is being accomplished. We've had people come to Christ here because of this crisis. The people are asking questions. They're, 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 they're contemplating spiritual matters that they've never talked about before. But when God does his work, he does it, and there's a will, there's a way, and it, it moves beyond our control. In South Asia, there was a group of missionaries who were walking down a, a road by a river, and, and as they were approaching the river, there's this old lady that was bent over because of her age, and she looked up, and she saw these missionaries coming, and she began to shout at them and begin to wave them down. <laughs> and finally, she got their attention, and they were in a dialogue, and she said, last night I had a dream. A, a person in a white robe appeared to me and said, tomorrow, if you go down to the river, there will be men there that will be able to give you God's word tomorrow at the river with these men. She looks to these men, are you the men? <laughs> are you the men that, that is going to bring... These missionaries had not only scripture, but scripture in her native tongue. And they were able to give that scripture to the lady, and the lady took it, and she just began to be overwhelmed. She says, all my life I've looked for God's word, and now I have it. I will go home, and I will read God's word to my children and to my grandchildren. And when they get the word of God inside of their systems and their heart, I can die in peace. Will of God. I don't understand it. I don't understand the vision in the middle of the night that tells an older lady to go to a river to meet men who are carrying a book that will give her hope and life. I don't understand that. I don't understand why a lady would be taken from China to Houston to be given Christ, to be brought back. I don't understand that. I don't understand why our brother here in Singapore that contracted the disease, uh, the, 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 the virus, and was thrown in isolation and be separated from his family. I don't understand that, but this is what I do understand, the will of God. This is God's will. And as we come down to the end in verse 6, it says, it's to the praise of the glory of his grace. In verse 12, it will also talk about to the praise of his glory. Verse 14, to the praise of his glory. As we move through the sovereignty of God, that God speaks hope, let me tell you and remind you, what is the purpose of this? It is for his glory and for his praise. I hate to break this to some of us who are 21st century comfort Christians. God's primary purpose is not for your comfort. His primary purpose is not for your safety physically. You read through Hebrews chapter 11, and you will starkly be instructed and reminded that God's people will always suffer. God's people, this is not home. This is not our final state. Ours is in the heavenlies. We have been chosen for that. We've been predestined for that. And now it comes to the time of praise. So as we close today, I want to encourage you as you walk out of here today to find someone who needs a word of hope. Just one person. One person that needs hope. One person that looks like they're overwhelmed. One person that looks like they're nervous. I think sometimes as we deal with our family back in the States, I think some of them are more nervous than we are. And they're questioning, they're asking, and yet, for those who are in the midst of it, if you have your hope in him, I want you to find one person. And I want you to change. Go through a challenge and change. Instead of blaming God or blaming this country or blaming the government or blaming this individual or blame, 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 I want you to turn that blame into blessing. When everything gets blurry and you can't see and you do not understand and we do not know what's going to happen next week and the next week and the next week, and, and that blurriness, I want us as a body of Christ to bless God, to speak highly of him, to praise him, to give him thanks for what he's doing. In our crisis, I need us to meet Christ. 
In our panic, I want you to be reminded that you've been predestined. That you've been, in your chaos, I want you to remember that you've been chosen. That in this, this, this pit of despair, that God has determined your path long before you got here. And if God can take a, 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 a Grace Assembly brother and bring him through this, and God can take a sister in, from, from Wuhan and bring her through this, and God can take a little lady in South Asia bent over with a simple vision, God has you securely in his hands. He has a plan for you. He has a design for you. Next week will be the second part to remind us of the sovereignty of God, that in the middle of our crisis, God speaks hope into your crisis. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for your simple word today of just reminding us that you have blessed us, and so we get to bless you, not blame you, not blame all the things that are happening around us, but we get to bless you. We get to bless you because we get to go through the testing and the temperature here. We bless you. We get to have this tag and this sticker on us. We bless you. For those who are live streaming, we bless you. Father, the blessing for many of our people, they've got to spend more time at home with their family. They've got to do less travel. Father, the, the simplicity of life has come, come back in, and we are blessing you. Father, when everything is chaotic and everything is crazy, Father, remind, remind, remind us that you've chosen us. And not just today, you chose us before the crisis came. You chose us before we were born. You chose us before the creation of the world. And Father, finally, when we're panicking and we're plummeting in despair, Father, let us never forget that we've been predestined according to your will and love. Father, as we send our people out, Father, we send them with a simple assignment, give hope to those around them. In Jesus' precious and powerful name we pray, amen. If you're here today and you need someone to chat with and talk with, we have pastors and uh, all available here for you. Pastor Lloyd's in the back. We're here in the front as well, but we would be honored to chat with you. Remember, go out this way and go with God's hope. Find at least one person this week and pass that hope to. God bless you and continue to pray for us as we move forward.